Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Paul Virilio's short essay titled The Last Vehicle. Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you're new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in a way that'll make them accessible to you. So if you're into that, like, share, comment, uh, subscribe. I'd love to see you back here. Uh, tell your friends they might get a kick out of this or they might not whatever. Uh, if you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads. If you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find me on YouTube as well, where I sometimes accompany the audio with video, which you might be into, but you might not. Um, if you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's talk about Virilio, specifically the last vehicle. Now, I haven't done a whole lot of Virilio on this channel. I think I've only done one of his books titled Open Sky, uh, I believe. And because Virilio is someone that I really, I really like his work, but there are very clear kind of conservative, religious, Christian undertones that really turn me off. And there's just a general fear of anything change in his work. And this is, this is a gross, uh, kind of broad generalization and it's something that I want to you know put a little asterisk by and say that of course there's still a lot to be gleaned from it but as I think will be clear in this text among any other that I might do in the future he very much wishes things could go back to the good old days which is obviously very problematic but let's just jump into the last vehicle he starts at this essay by talking about uh, a pool in Tokyo that is a small it's probably like a 10 by 8 little body of water where swimmers go into and there's like a, a jet stream pushing water in one direction so that swimmers can swim just in one spot and get their workout. So they don't need a whole expansive pool, they only need one spot to work out in. Now the same can be said of like a treadmill or an elliptical or anything like that where you are moving without actually physically moving. You are your body thinks you're moving, but you aren't actually going anywhere physically, geographically. So he says that in this moment, inertia seems to replace movement through space, where you are moving without having to move. Now he uses this image of the pool to think about audiovisual communication, where, and many of us certainly lived this through COVID, we were relying more and more upon things like Zoom or Skype to communicate with one another, which allowed us to kind of move. It allowed us to transport ourselves somewhere else without actually physically having to move. Now, Virilio's big point is that it's kind of difficult to differentiate physically moving through the world and virtually moving through the world, where if we just reduce these experiences to uh, however it might make us feel, then it's hard to differentiate the two. Now what he's going to come to say is obviously he prefers physically moving through the world as having a more of an attachment to the world and to each other. And so he is very skeptical of the emergence of new kinds of communication that sort of replace traveling. So if I were to give an example, let's say you were on a plane and you were physically on a plane moving from New York to Paris. You're going to Paris, you aren't physically moving your body, but you're, you're traveling there anyways. And the same could be said if you were on a ship from a few hundred years ago or a carriage from even longer before then or, or whatever, you could move without physically actually having to move. But now let's imagine that on your trip to Paris, you're watching one of those little TVs on some of the nicer planes on the back of the seat in front of you, and you're watching a film that takes place in, I don't know, Nigeria, hypothetically, whatever, some place in the world. So in that moment, you are traveling to Paris without physically moving but you are almost living, experiencing Nigeria while also not moving. And so suddenly you could travel anywhere in zero time. The world seems to just expand in front of you in this infinite possibility without taking up any time. You can go from any place to anywhere else instantaneously. Now he thinks about this in terms of a museum where he says that one of the dynamics that are present is present in a very big museum is that you get no time 
with any specific painting because you're like, or sculpture or whatever, because you just want to move around and experience everything while you can because you have no time to look at everything if it's big enough. So you can actually sit there and enjoy anything and really have an embodied feeling, embodied relationship with it, and you just see time ticking down and you gotta go somewhere else. So the more space that is made accessible to you, the smaller or the shorter time gets and the sh less amount of time you want to be spending on any one thing, which I think he would extend to say that, oh well, people today are so much more impatient. They always have to be doing things. It's the rat race, you know, always having to run around which there is some truth to, but anyway, so th that's what he gives us so far. So he calls these new forms of travel just um, intermissions in our life where they don't have any meaning in themselves. Where at another time, it wasn't the destination, it was the journey that was important. It was about the process of getting somewhere. Now we've lost our attachment to that and instead have begun to, begun to just put our focus on the end goal, the end result. So we don't see value in other places where we historically saw value. We instead just attribute it to the immediate uh, climax, the gratification of arriving at the end point. And so this went through successive phases where I mentioned earlier, there would be the carriage wagon and then the boat and then the plane and so on and so forth, the home vehicle that would you know, go, go on and on to the point that we arrive at the audiovisual form of communication that exerts or presents not um, kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy that is produced through movement, physical movement, like car produces kinetic energy because it's moving through space. We instead have what he calls, and this is something he builds on in other texts, kinematic energy, which is a play on kinetic energy and cinematic energy that is produced through these virtual or simulated forms of travel. And with this correlative form of energy makes it difficult then to actually distinguish between actually physically moving through space that produces kinetic energy and moving through like virtual space that produces a kind of kinematic energy that is a correlative form of energy that part helps, I guess, kind of proffer up this illusion of traveling in the world. Now, the fear that he has is that we will become more and more reliant on these technologies that allow this kind of travel. So we will become more and more sedentary physically as humans, you know, being more relegated to our houses, which is going to result in the diminishment of the public sphere. It's gonna result in the diminishment of human relations. It's probably for him, he's concerned about uh, the Catholic church ending or whatever, where people are going to stop having the kinds of fruitful connections that they would otherwise have when they had to actually move through the world. And he says, kind of, tongue-in-cheek like that in response to all this hyper movement through virtual space we might erect immobility simulators simulators that are meant to slow us down just to give us the sense of having a mobile experience in space not just in virtual space and we could say that this is maybe one of the reasons with an obsession with like running for example or, or jogging or people taking walks. Like we designated, we designate times, we designate spaces that are meant to be away from it all. When that only serves the function of maintaining the system of simulated travel, of maintaining the kind of hyperspeed form of travel that is expected of us in this day and age, where we always have to be accessible on our phones. We always have to respond to emails immediately or else people are gonna get anxious and so on and so forth. And I'm saying this as someone who enjoys running quite a bit. I think that this is, Paul Ferrillio would read that as being just one of the ways that we convince ourselves that we haven't moved totally beyond physical travel in space. And I know I covered uh, Baudrillard's text last week, Why Theory, and I got this one from The Hatred of Capitalism volume uh, as well, which if you haven't listened to that Baudrillard episode, I'll just say here that I think that it's a great text the Hatred of Capitalism, you should definitely check it out, even though the title doesn't really match many of the essays in the in the collection, but in any case, it's what, it's that's what it is. Uh, but it's a great little volume, but this text is also found in another volume uh, called Looking Back at the End of the World, which is a collection of essays by other people, including Baudrillard as well, and, and Virilio, including others, 
uh, um, who I, whom I can't remember, but it's a, it's a really fascinating little text with some very enigmatic essays that I definitely recommend to anyone. Like this is it specifically. Uh, it's a very tiny little text with a, with a bunch of different essays by uh, Gebauer, Camper, Lenzen, Morin, uh, Wolf, a number of different thinkers that <laughs> I, I don't know what was happening to, for them to collect these essays, but some very interesting ideas coming out of this little book that I definitely recommend to anyone where you'll find this essay in is actually where I first found it, where I think that you could glean a lot from the rest of it. But yeah, just rambling at this point. Uh, if you listen this far, if there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. You know, leave a comment. Uh, I don't have the time to respond to all of them or leave a review. Uh, leave five stars on a podcast platform if you have that opportunity. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Take care.